everybody doing today? Good. 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 Did everybody see the artillery demonstration yet? No. no. Alright, well you get your chance after we're done. So about 4 o'clock uh, they'll be having the artillery demonstration right at the end. Right over here at Shepherd's Battery, right at the end of the port. Ours is better. Ours is better. It's not as loud. But... I can't. I hate this. Who is his? Anybody here last year? Who was here? No. Mm -mm. Yeah. 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 Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Fort Fisher State Historic Site. My name is Jeff Bockert. I'm the East Region Supervisor for the Division of Historic Sites and Properties. And on behalf, uh, behalf of the department, we'd like to welcome everybody here to Fort Fisher for our Living History Program today. This is one of many Living History Program and events that we have throughout our 24 state historic sites throughout the state of North Carolina. And for more information on events such as these, we encourage you to check out our website at www.nchistoricsites.org for a listing of events in, uh, in your neck of the woods uh, if you're from here in North Carolina. Now, uh, what we're going to talk a little bit about today are uh, infantry uh, tactics and uniforms and show you what the average Confederate soldier looked like here at the Battle of Fort Fisher. Um, the, the garrison here at Fort Fisher was under the command of Colonel William Lamb, who was a Virginian. He was from Norfolk. And uh, he was in charge of the 36th North Carolina troops, uh, which was an artillery regiment stationed here at Fort Fisher. Uh, construction of the fort began in 1862 and lasted, uh, it never really ceased. Uh, when the fort was taken, it was still being constructed. Uh, at the time of its fall in January of 1865, it was considered one of the most powerful forts in the world at that time. It was modeled after, the, uh, after the, uh, a fort, uh, the Crimean Tower in Sevastopol, and uh, during the uh, Crimean War in the 1850s, so made completely out of sand. Uh, and this was used to, uh, to absorb the shock of a, of a naval bombardment. The original fort stretched all the way to my left from the Cape Fear River all the way down to the ocean. This is called the land face. And these are some of the mounds you see here left over of the land face. At the, uh, at the, at the end there, it would uh, go about a mile down the beach. And that was called the sea face. And where, they two, where the two meet is called the Northeast Bastion. And that's where the headquarters of the fort was. The Northeast Bastion is about 200 yards out into the ocean right now. Due to erosion, that's where it is now. It culminated at the end, down near the ferry turn, uh, actually in the, uh, in the uh, parking lot of the aquarium. Uh, that was Mound Battery, and that was where the uh, fort ended there. There was another fort down at the end, at Shepherd's Battery, uh, which we'll talk about in just a few minutes, and that's where the fort finally surrendered in January of 1865. Now, why was Fort Fisher important? Fort Fisher was important mainly because it protected the Port of Wilmington, which is up the Cape Fear River. Uh, in, in 1861, the United States Navy imposed a blockade on all southern ports to keep uh, supplies from coming into the Confederacy from overseas. The Confederacy didn't have a lot of manufacturing of their own, so they had to import everything. And so the Union Navy blockade kept supplies from coming in. By January of 1865, Wilmington was the last port open for the Confederacy, so it had to be closed. And uh, Robert E. Lee in the trenches of Petersburg in 1864 stated, that if Wilmington fell, he would have to abandon his lines around Petersburg. And that's exactly what happened. So it was the last major fort, uh, uh, fort open to the Confederacy. Fort Fisher guarded Wilmington, so very important. There were two battles that were fought here. The first one was in uh, the, called the Christmas Battle, December of 1864, of course on Christmas Day. The Union Navy and Army arrived off the fort and uh, began a bombardment. Uh, a lot of the shells went wide and, uh, above their mark and landed in the Cape Fear River and in the marsh behind us. Uh, and the Union Army uh, landed and uh, came close to the fort and said and didn't see a lot of damage. So they boarded back up onto the ships and went back to Newport News, Virginia. So all went well except for the, the only thing that was really damaged here were the, uh, the barracks for the troops were burned in the, uh, in the bombardment so they had to sleep in the bomb proofs. A couple weeks later, in January of 1865, the Union forces returned. On January 13, 1865, 
56 United States Navy ships, the largest armada the United States Navy had ever put in one place before, began a two-day bombardment of the fort. It was the largest amphibious assault up until D-Day of 1944 that happened here at Fort Fisher. 56 Union vessels fired on the fort for two days. Their fire was extremely effective, knocking out all but one cannon on the land face and all but two cannons on the sea face. Now, uh, the Union Army under uh, General uh, Alfred Terry, 9,000 man strong, uh, veteran of the Army of the James, landed uh, in what is day, now modern day Carolina Beach. They set up what's called a line of revetment, uh, just where the, uh, the lake is in Carolina Beach today. It went from the ocean all the way to the uh, river. And this was to prevent a counterattack from coming down uh, from Wilmington to aid the fort's defenders. So on the morning of January 15, 1865, the stage was set for the battle. At the end of the bombardment, everything went quiet, and the Union Navy uh, out into the heart, out into the ocean here, all did their steam whistles at the same time. So very loud to signal the beginning of the assault. The first assault came uh, for the U.S. Navy and Marines landed and attacked the northeast bastion of the fort, and they were armed with pistols and cutlasses, and they were mowed down before they got close to the fort's walls. But what they didn't realize is that they were a diversion because Colonel William Lamb, the commander of the fort, looked to his left and saw Union battle flags on Shepherd's Battery. The Union force of 6,000 strong busted through this, this River Road sally port and then they captured Shepherd's Battery. From there, it was hand-to-hand -hand fighting across the dunes and across the mounds, all the way down the land face. Colonel William Lamb and Major General Whiting launched a Confederate counterattack on the fourth gun traverse right over here. And both of them were wounded in the counterattack. Confederates slowly started to retreat back down to the end of the, uh, the end of the peninsula, and it was there late at night on January 15, 1865, that uh, Major Riley, who then took over command of the fort, surrendered Fort Fisher to the United States forces and closed off uh, Fort Fisher. One month later, in February February 22, 1865, Wilmington fell to United States forces and closed off the major last major port to the Confederacy. Less than a month and a half later, Robert E. Lee surrendered his forces at Appomattox Courthouse on April 9, 1865. So, what did the Confederate soldier here at Fort Fisher look like? A member of the 36th North Carolina Troop. Sergeant here is dressed as a member of the 36th North Carolina as he would appear here at Battle of Fort Fisher in January of 1865. His uniform was manufactured here in, the, in North Carolina uh, under what's called the North Carolina Depot pattern, even though the, the material for his hat and his coat were made in England and brought in over on the blockade. Cap is called a kepi. It was a French style cap. Uh, you see these a lot in movies, and that's what the garrison had. It had a red trim, which denoted artillery. Remember, the 36th North Carolina were artillerymen. They made the big gun. The jacket is uh, made out of English cloth, in the North Carolina pattern, with red collar, and sometimes they had red cuffs to denote them as uh, artillery. <coughs> the trousers were made out of what's called jeans cloth, which is a mixture of wool and cotton, Sort of like your blue jeans or denim and cotton. This is wool and cotton. So they called it jeans cloth. And that's where you get blue jeans later is made out of denim. Okay. The, uh, the shoes are made out of leather. They're either imported from England or made in the warehouses in Raleigh. Everything else is everything he would need to fire his weapon in, in, in an infantry style. He has his waist belt, which has a cap pouch on it. The cap pouch held uh, percussion caps, which we'll talk a little bit more about those in just a few minutes. The bayonet scabbard held the bayonet, which went on the end of the rifle. You'll see those in just a few minutes as well. The English style cartridge box here would have contained uh, ammunition, pre-rolled ca cartridges uh, made out of paper, filled with black powder and a manet ball at the bottom, which they would use to fire the weapon. Caversack here was uh, for food, and the canteen, of course, held the uh, held water. Now. Now, the, uh, the primary weapon that was used by the fort's defenders was this weapon, the Model 1853 Enfield Rifle, which was uh, imported from England. And so this was considered one of the best weapons of the day. The Enfield Rifle would be equivalent to, I'd say, the AK-47 of today. It was, uh, it was used by a lot of people. The United States Springfield Rifle was equivalent to the modern-day M16. It was used by a lot of United States forces. Some found their way south as well. So. Once you joined the Confederate Army, what was next? You would go into what's called a camp of instruction. The camp of instruction for the uh, men down here at, the, at Fort Fisher was a Camp Wyatt, which was just north of us uh, near modern-day Carolina Beach. And that's where they went through camp of instruction. 
Now, what did they learn there? The first thing that they learned how to do was how to carry the weapon. And this is called the manual of arms. These weapons weigh about 10 pounds, which doesn't sound like a lot until you're lugging it all over Virginia and it gets heavy quick. So you have to move it from arm to arm to keep, uh, to keep the soldier's arms from giving out. The right shoulder shift was used for a uh, tall brush or running, balances the weapon. Everything goes back to the shoulder, which is this position here, shoulder arms. Support arms was used for guard duty because the weapon couldn't touch the ground. And so if you give the right arm a rest, put it up on the left arm. Everything goes back to the shoulder. Arms port. Arms port is another way of holding the weapon. It just basically gets both hands on it, gives both of your shoulders a little bit of a break. Shoulder. Goes back to the shoulder. Secure. Secure arms was used for inclement weather. You didn't want rain to get down the barrel. Black powder and rain mix into a paste, and it will not fire if it gets wet. So you have to keep the barrel dry. Order arms, of course, the weapon on the ground. Parade rest was used when you didn't want the men to talk in the ranks, but you didn't want them to move around any either. In place rest was used, you had to keep one foot stationary, the other one could move around. One had to stay, and you could talk in the ranks. Now, once you learned how to handle your weapon, you'd learn how to fire it. Now, in camp of instruction, this was called loading by the nine times, which means that it takes nine different steps to load the weapon. So the first thing you would do is handle a cartridge. The cartridge were made out of paper and filled with black powder and a manet ball. You tear off the top, revealing the black powder. You pour the powder down the barrel and insert the ball. We're not firing a ball today. People on 421 wouldn't like it, I think. <laughs> You draw the rammer because everything right now is up here, right? You want it down here. So you use the rammer. Ram. Cartridge. Ramming the cartridge all the way down into the to the breach. Return rammer. Now you'll have to return the rammer or you have to go 200 yards downrange to retrieve it to fire again. <laughs> Now, the prime, what they're doing is they're putting a percussion cap in the cap pouch. It's a copper piece filled with fulminant and mercury, which is an explosive charge. Now, you'd put this on the cone right here onto the weapon. Now, when I pull this hammer all the way back and fire it, it comes down, creates a spark in the barrel, which creates, uh, goes into a hole into the barrel and ignites the powder and blows everything out. That's how the weapon operates. Technological marvel. <laughs> now, the safety for the weapons is half cock. So if I put it to half cock and pull the trigger, nothing four, happens. Four. Right? Only when you pull it all the way back will it fire. Fire. All right, now the weapon is loaded. So you've learned how to carry the weapon, you've learned how to load the weapon, and now you'll learn how to march. And so what the men will be doing now is going through some company formations to show you how they march during the Civil War. Shoulder. Oh. Now this is the size of a company in January of 1865. Hey. A company at the beginning of the war was supposed to be 100 men. But by this time of the war, you didn't have that on either side, the Union or the Confederacy. At Appomattox Courthouse, Lee surrendered in some of his companies six or seven right. men. Hey. So about 25 right. men for January of 1865 would be considered a good-sized company. All right. Now, when they, were marked, when they were standing in front of you, that's called a battle line. That's how they fought. They fought shoulder to shoulder a battle line and delivered uh, volleys to the enemy. Now, to march around, that doesn't really work very well. So what they have to do is split them up in what's called a column, or a column of fours. And so that way they could snake around the battlefield any way they wanted to, and it made it a lot easier to get from point A to point B. Now, as you see, it's a slow, measured tread. They walk very slowly. This is called the common step. Now, the common step wasn't very fast, but this is about how fast they walk. Now, if you're the enemy and firing at them right now, and they have to get into a battle line quickly, They'll go into what? Company in the line. Company in the line, they can get into a battle line very quickly and then return fire at you.
Now, a captain would use his company as his personal weapon. So he would position his company in such a way to deliver the best fire on the enemy as he could. Now, a company was uh, only one part of a regiment. A regiment had 10 companies. So this would have been one of 10 companies in a regiment. The 36th North Carolina was the regiment that was here. Countermarch. Now, countermarching means basically they're going to change front because they don't want to fire into you. So what they're going to do is they're going to uh, face uh, to the rear now, and this is what's called countermarching. Now we're going into the firing portion of our demonstration. For those of you that don't like loud noises, you can cover your ears. Uh, if you have hearing aids, I suggest you turn down. It won't be a, uh, a nuclear explosion by any means, but if you're sensitive to loud noises, you might want to cover your ears. Carolina spent a lot of money on this expensive barricade to keep you safe, and so it only worked one way, and that's you have to stay on that side. These men are highly, uh, highly skilled in the use of these weapons, are highly trained in them. Uh, but black powder is a uh, dangerous, uh, a dangerous substance. company. Now, the first thing he's going to do is firing by company, which means everybody will fire. Let's see. combat, what's the problem with this? Your company is unloaded. You are not loaded right now, so you're a sitting duck for the enemy. So until you can load again in 38 seconds, you're a sitting duck. This was rarely used in the Civil War. No company commander would fire his entire company off at the same time. So what they would do, they had a couple different variations. First thing they'd do is called firing by rank. Now with firing by rank, the, fire re by rank. the rear rank will fire first. Front rank, kneel! Rear rank, aim! Let see, let see. Fire! Well, the rear rank is loading, the front rank is still loaded. And so it goes back, back and forth. Front rank, rear rank, front rank, rear rank. Front rank, drive! Front rank! Now, this was fairly effective, but there was another way to fire that was more effective and was the most commonly used during the Civil War. This is called firing by file. Now, this is sort of like the machine gun of the day. What they would do is each one of these two men together is a file. So on the right, they'll start firing and on down the line, firing. By the time it gets down to the end, the guys on the right are loaded. So it's continuous. A solid volley of lead all the way down the line. This is how the Union Army would complete Holt's Peckett and Pettigrew's charge against them, by using firing by files and massed artillery. Nice. Now, after they went down to the end of the line, it was uh, firing at will, which basically means he can't fire as quickly as he can load his weapon. Now, remember, this is one company. Imagine a regiment of 10 of these companies, and then a brigade of four regiments. A division of four, uh, four, uh, uh, four brigades. And so you're talking about thousands and thousands of men. Now the last firing he's going to do is, called, is once again firing by company. And the reason for this is he wants to make sure all of his men are unloaded. So we'll fire them all off at the same time. Prime, which means they're just going to put on a percussion cap. And the reason for this is just to make sure that none of the weapons are still loaded. If you had a misfire at any time, putting a percussion cap on it's going to see who the guy was who misfired. So we'll see who if we have any misfires. Public humiliation at its fine. <laughs> Guard duty tonight for him. 
So just like in the modern army, even then, you never sent the soldier back to barracks with a loaded weapon. So you always want to make sure after, them, after his uh, drill that uh, they would be unloaded. Company! Hey. Oh. No, so just the caps that oh. you hear firing. Now, he's going to position the company to get into for what's called a bayonet charge. Now, the bayonet, as we said before, was the bayonet that was issued, that put onto the end of the weapon. All right? It looks fearsome, but in reality, they weren't used a lot for what they were intended. Less than one-tenth of one percent of all wounds received in the Civil War were from the bayonet. So, you just didn't get that close. So they had other things they used them for. They used them as candlesticks. They used them as tent stakes. They would cook meat over the fire with them. And sometimes, more grisly, they would heat them up and bend them to pull bodies off the battlefield. So they were used for a lot of different ways other than what they were intended. Exception being here the Battle of Fort Fisher, which was mostly hand-to-hand -hand fighting. The bayonet was used a lot. Now, you see in the movies and bayonet charges where they basically just run at the enemy pell-mell and uh, try and throw them off the field. That doesn't work very well in real life. All right, you have to have a measured tramp and everybody has to be marching together. The key is, is to push the enemy off the battlefield. And you do this when the enemy's kind of falling back like this, they're kind of scared, they're kind of enemy out of ammunition, they're about ready to run. You do a bayonet charge, they're gonna run. All right, the natural human aversion is not to get stabbed. Well, at least it's mine. I don't know if it's true. So that's the way that they would use a bayonet charge. Now, the Confederates, when they uh, charge, uh, would you do what's called the rebel yell, which is like a loud scream, which you'll hear in just a moment. When the Union Army advanced and, and charged bayonets, they did a hurrah or a huzzah. And so you would know who's charging who on the battlefield by the sounds they were making. Now you see it's a, a very slow measured pace. Now when he gets the order to charge bayonets, they'll move a little bit quicker, but not a run. Now, ladies and gentlemen, the folks you see in front of you here today are members of several living history organizations. Uh, they are not employed by us by the state of North Carolina. Uh, they are volunteers. Uh, they spend thousands and thousands of their own dollars and uh, do all of their own research uh, to come out here and on their days off and drive hundreds of miles to do programs just like this for you. Uh, so uh, let's give them all a big round of applause. In the Division of Historic Sites, we would not be able to put on programs without these gentlemen here. So with that, we have time for a few questions. Do we have any questions? Yes, sir. It was cold. It was cold. Um, 